Okay, so we go five, four, three, two, one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on preparing for MACRA in a value-based care environment. And this webinar is just one of a collection of resources that Kauffman Hall has developed to help you understand the nuances and impact of MACRA and to develop your strategy. You can find these resources at kauffmanhall.com slash MACRA. After the session, you'll get a link to an archived version of this webinar and other resources, and you should feel free to share that with your colleagues. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by three members of Kauffman Hall's MACRA team, Todd Fitz, Managing Director, uh, we'll kick us off. Todd will be followed by Chelsea Glenn, and last but never least, Anand Krishnaswamy. With that, I will turn it over to Todd Fitz. Great. Thank you, Robin. Good morning, everybody. Um, we, you know, we're excited to talk about something that's, that's becoming even more exciting for you out there uh, in the industry, and that's the implementation of MACRA. Uh, now that the final rule is out, um, a lot of people are starting to take notice, arguably many are starting to take notice a little late, um, but taking notice nonetheless. So today, uh, just briefly, what we'll talk about is um, introducing the final rule, the implications for the near term, particularly 2017, dive a little bit into the detail of re requirements and talk a little bit about your options. And this is part of, um, John, and can you advance one? That's right. This is going to be part of a three webinar series, um, starting today with more of an overview, with webinar two being more about the strategic, um, you know, implications and strategic planning around MACRA, and webinar three um, being around the financial nuances and financial planning. And so we hope you'll join us uh, for the next two, and you can see the dates there. So again, today is really about understanding some of the details. I won't read you know, each, each bullet on this slide. Um, there's a lot of nuances to this program. The final rule was well over 1,000 pages. Um, some of us have read most. <laughs> some of us have not read much. Um, and, and I'm assuming most of you are just getting familiar. Um, but if, but if this continues to move forward, um, you know, understanding those nuances is really going to be critical to making sure you're successful because um, the choices you make, the paths you choose, are going to have very real implications um, and potentially negative implications in a way um, that most of us have never really had to deal with. Uh, as it relates in particular to physician reimbursement. So, so to start, you know, just want to hit on um, macro big picture um, a, as well as the final rule, which was just out a, a couple weeks ago. And, and the interesting thing about uh, macro and, and the rollout of macro uh, and some of the requirements for macro is that um, one, a lot of the providers um, haven't really been paying attention or haven't really been giving this a lot of thought. And you can see there um, a recent study that, that Deloitte published a little bit earlier this year that 50% that uh, of the physicians out in the market hadn't even heard of MACRA. And, you know, beyond that, when we start to look at some of the key requirements of MACRA, um, there's a lot of physicians who haven't started doing some of the fundamental things like reporting PQRS metrics or participating in meaningful use. So as we think about this starting to go live in 2017, uh, which again is two months away, um, this lack of, of familiarity and sort of lack of, of action around this is going to put a lot of organizations at risk and, and most notably going to create a lot of, of, of turmoil or vibration in, in, the, in the physician community, whether that's the employed physicians or the physicians out in the market. And we've really started to see that um, accelerate in the last, last couple months 
um, with, with physicians, particularly um, small practice physicians out in the market, um, really getting concerned about this and reaching out uh, particularly to the health systems for insight um, and assistance with this. So one of the things that the, the final rule made some, some relatively significant changes in was around who's eligible and who's exempt. Um, as you can see here, uh, MACRA is not limited just to physicians. Um, it goes into the advanced practice pr uh, providers, uh, as well as potentially, although it's not, um, it's not defined yet, uh, may continue to bring in other clinician types there in the blue box. There are some exclusions, though, um, particularly physicians new to the Medicare program, um, physicians that are, are very low volume, um, and that low volume is, is defined there in the first footnote. So. Um, $30,000 or less in Part B billings or uh, um, under 100 patients in a year. Um, some of the rural, the FQHC physicians, et cetera. So there are a fair amount of exclusions um, in the program. Um, but all that said, there's, there's still quite a few physicians that are going to be impacted. So as MACRA is structured, there are two main tracks um, um, that is really the first big, the first big decision, sorry, that, that providers will have to make, and that's whether to go down the, uh, the MIPS track, as, as you probably heard, the merit-based incentive payment track, or the, the APM, the advanced APM track, the alternative payment model track, um, which is a little bit more, um, we'll say, sophisticated. Um, than the MIPS track, um, and, and out of the gate, most likely the path that um, fewer physicians and fewer practices will, will undertake, but over time, um, we expect more physicians to move from the MIPS track to the APM track, and, and actually CMS has made it pretty clear that, that they expect and hope that as well. Um, as it relates to the timeline, um, a couple of key points here. Uh, as I mentioned, 2017 is when uh, this will start to take effect, um, although it's important to note that um, there is a two-year lag between the performance year and the payment year, um, meaning you're going to be measured, for example, in 2017, um, but that payment effect's not going to happen until 2019. And that really carries through um, throughout the program as it's designed. 2017 and 2018 are meant to be transition years, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, before you kind of get fully um, into MACRA. And so there, there's some opportunity to, um, you know, grow into this. It's, it will hopefully alleviate some of the shock for many providers and allow you to, to really put in place some of the strategies for success. Um, and then obviously, um, the impact on reimbursement, um, both relative to uh, the base fees as well as the potential bonuses, um, will be ranged and capped. Um, but, but it's important to note that there is the potential and the significant potential for uh, negative adjustments to reimbursement, which we'll touch on in a second. So relative to the final rule, again, which came out a couple of weeks ago, um, a, a few key notes. Um, 2017 is a transitional year. We'll talk about you know, what that means exactly uh, here in a little bit. Um, one of the, the areas where, where MACRA really had uh, or really created challenges was around small and independent physician practices. Um, there were some changes in the rule, particularly related to uh, the low volume threshold and, and some of the requirements for MIPS um, that, that hopefully will re alleviate some of the burden on those smaller practices. Um, but as we'll see, they're, they're still facing significant risk. Um, and for those of you that are in markets where there are still quite a few small uh, and or independent physician offices, um, you're going to feel the impact um, uh, of MACRA and probably see a lot more um, push to uh, consolidation uh, and or partnership 
um, than those markets that are maybe um, already fairly consolidated. Um, there were also uh, opportunities presented for, for uh, additional advanced APM models. We'll talk about those a little bit. Uh, and then the reporting requirements were relaxed um, a little bit, which is good because that'll help more people uh, participate and succeed. <clears throat> So the specific implications for 2017, again, so you know what you need to consider for two months from now and, and the positions in your market, um, um, if they're independent, should be considering uh, in, in the very near term, is deciding which option for 2017 uh, you wish to participate in. And so between the MIPS track and the advanced APM track, um, there really are four options, three relative to MIPS in, in the, the advanced APM track. Um, it's important to note, though, that, that these are a range, and depending on your level of participation, uh, it will dictate um, what your potential upside relative to reimbursement is. And so if, if you're a full reporting uh, practice or physician under MIPS, um, you will be eligible both for an exceptional performance bonus as well as a positive adjustment to fees. Um, if you are minimum participant, option three there, um, basically all you're doing is avoiding a negative payment adjustment. Uh, the, the, the most upside potential, uh, as will be the case throughout the program, is, is by participating uh, in the APM uh, track. So. As, as the final rule came out and, and some of the numbers um, started to be circulated, some key things to note. Um, given the exemption list I mentioned earlier, 48% of clinicians are expected to be exempt, um, which, which seems like a big number, but it also means that 52% of physicians will not be exempt. And we'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of those that are exempt. Um, and 95% of MIPS participants um, are expected to avoid a negative penalty in 2017. Um, so as long as you're participating, um, the likelihood that you're going to avoid a negative penalty is fairly significant, with only 5% uh, by, by default um, uh, likely to incur a negative penalty. Uh, but the way that that plays out is very different between uh, the, the physician population. Uh, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, small practices uh, are much more at risk to receive a penalty uh, than, than larger groups, and, and there's a multiple set of reasons for that. And then as it relates to specialists, it also varies quite a bit with certain specialists much more at risk than others, and we'll, we'll highlight that here in a second. So the, the key thing here is of, of the 48% that are excluded, um, the, the biggest chunk of that, the 28% there kind of in the middle of that table, are the low volume physicians. Um, you know, that accounts for 28% for of, of the 48% total. Um, the ineligible, again, which is um, some of the, the FQHC and other types of physicians, or the new physicians make up the rest. Um, and so the, the, the main thought here, and, and what we'll probably talk about much more in the strategic section is, if you've got physicians that are near the threshold um, and you're already having uh, issues around access, uh, most physicians may decide to, to further limit their participation in Medicare just not to have to deal with this. And that's a potential risk, uh, again, we'll need to think about. Um, as, as we think about which track, or at least as CMS has thought about which track uh, physicians will participate in, uh, roughly 10 to 17 percent uh, will take that advanced APM track, um, with the, the remainder falling to the MIPS track um, and or non-participating, um, which is, is really not an option, but some will, will end up doing that. Uh, briefly, on the, on the practice size here, the four kind of sets of bars to the left are by practice size. You can see there in that call-out box that the small practices are going to receive 50% of the 
of all of the MIPS penalties, um, even though they represent only 22% of the physicians. So much more at risk there um, than the other practices, but you can see there's expected negative impacts across them all. The other thing, if, if you're not aware yet, is that the program's designed to be effectively budget neutral. You can see there on the far right the total, um, the dark blue and the red um, basically wash out with $500 million kicked in every year um, for the exceptional performance bonus. So that, that is not exactly budget neutral, uh, but that's just a fixed amount. And then lastly, I think here uh, by specialty, you can see that there are certain specialties where there is um, a greater likelihood of negative impacts um, from, from participation in MIPS. Um, overall, uh, it's going to be about 5% across the MIPS participants. Um, so you can see in psychiatry and orthopedic surgery, much higher likelihood uh, of downside risk as it relates to reimbursement and something to consider as you reach out to your physicians across the organization. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Anand Chelsea here to get into a much greater level of detail in both of the tracks. Excellent. So we will start off with the MIPS track, as the majority of providers are expected to fall into MIPS for at least the first few years. So within the MIPS track, there are two main pathways. You can be kind of in the general MIPS eligible population where you're filing as an individual or as a group under 10, um, or you could be reporting as a MIPS eligible APM. Now, if you are reporting under the general model as a group, uh, all of the individu individuals in that 10 are assigned the same score. So this will have implications. For instance, if you're in a large multi-specialty group, the quality measures you select to report or the improvement activities you do may not apply equally across your specialist, or your individual specialist might not have a lot of control over those outcomes. CMS has intentionally created this structure to incentivize team-based care and optimize value at the group level rather than just at the individual level. Now, if you're instead in the MIPS-eligible APM, this means one of two things generally. Either you're an APM model that has a one-sided risk model or only takes on a little bit of downside risk, so you're not meeting the financial risk criteria of the advanced APM. Alternatively, maybe you are in an APM that does meet that financial risk criteria, but your Medicare Part B payments or patient count doesn't hit the thresholds required by the uh, advanced APM model, so you too are in this. Um, as a MIPS APM, you do have some benefits. Uh, including your quality reporting, for instance, is aligned with the APM model requirements that you're already undergoing. CMS doesn't want to overburden you because they want to incentivize MIPS APM models. Uh, additionally, for the practice improvement activities, you get an automatic set of scoring just for being an APM, so you get a bonus there. Now, although MIPS APMs have a little bit different of scoring, once they have a composite score, they're brought back into the general population. So in calculating the bonus penalty comparative calculation, uh, the individuals and groups who are filing compete directly with MIPS APMs. And CMS does this so that uh, it's incentivizing you know, rising tide, bringing everyone up in value-based care, as well as encouraging people to switch to a MIPS APM model. Now again, just as a reminder, for 2017, the reporting requirements are lessened because it's a transition year and a pick-your-pace approach. Next slide, please. So what MACRA intends to do, what MIPS intends to do, is simplify three legacy programs into a single unified whole. So it takes PQRS, the value-based payment modifier and meaningful use, and unites them into a program that hopefully offers greater flexibility in terms of the specific metrics that you can choose to best fit your organization's characteristics and priorities. So for instance, in quality, there is now a specialty subset. So if you're an anesthesiologist or uh, immunologist, you can specifically report on things that apply to you. Um, now we aren't going to go into all of the reporting requirements and mechanisms for each of the four groups. We have that information on our website, and I'd highly recommend looking that, into that. What I will mention is that for 2017, you don't have to report the full year performance year. You just have to report a continuous 90 days. And in 2018, this extends for advancing care and clinical practice improvement activities. You just need 90 continuous days. 
And then the full MIPS program, you will, uh, for 2019 and beyond, you will need to report the full performance year. Now to quickly go into each of the new categories, for quality, in most cases, there are fewer reporting requirements under PQRS, and CMS has introduced the specialty specific subsets, like I mentioned, to make measure selection easier. Quality scoring is benchmarked against all uh, participants that are reporting that measure, so you have to perform well, and then additionally you have to perform well compared to your peers. Um, and then as mentioned, MIPS APM shouldn't have to change from their current reporting that they're doing through their own APM model for quality. Now for resource use, which is now also referred to as cost in the final rule, for 2017 it's not measured, but CMS will issue an advisory performance report so you can kind of gauge how you would have done. Um, this is automatically calculated by CMS using claims data, so there's no additional reporting for resource use. And performance in this category is also benchmarked against, for, against your peers. And as of now, MIPS APMs are completely exempt from the cost category, as CMS didn't want to create potentially conflicting incentives within the individual APM requirements. CMS is looking to change this in future years, um, but they haven't figured out how to incorporate cost without creating kind of perverse incentives. So for advancing care, what CMS wanted to do is flesh out meaningful use a little more rather than just make it a sole all or nothing approach. Um, and they wanted to really emphasize interoperability, care coordination, and security measures. Um, so there are a base set of five required electronic capabilities. You have to score basically anything on these five capabilities to even be eligible for points within advancing care. And these are uh, security risk analysis, electronic prescribing, providing patient electronic access, sending a summary of care, and requesting or accepting a summary of care. So if you hit those five in any capacity, you can start earning additional performance score and bonus score on top of that, but you have to hit at least those five. Finally, the new category is clinical practice improvement activities, or in the final rule, it's also just called improvement activities. This is the new category, and CMS aims to develop incentives and policies that drive better patient outcomes and encourage physicians to transition to the APM path. Um, and actually, in the final rule, CMS has scaled back its requirements for this category due to the comments it received in the proposed rule. So there are around 90 activities that CMS has proposed for this category, and they're divided into nine main subcategories, all surrounding patient care coordination and there are things like beneficiary engagement, population management, integration of behavioral and mental health, and achieving health equity. Generally, you're required to report on two to four activities annually, depending on the priority level of the chosen activities. Some are weighted medium and some are weighted high priority. Um, so it'd be two high priority or four medium priority, for instance. There is an exception made for non-patient facing clinicians, practices with less than 16 clinicians, or those located in rural areas, and geographic health professional shortage areas who only have to compete, complete one to two activities depending on the priority level. CMS recognizes that these tend to be more resource strapped uh, providers, so they've created this exception. Okay, um, next slide, yes. So MIPS features importantly this escalating set of penalties and bonuses to really incentivize the transition to value-based care. As you saw in the fee timeline before, 2017 begins with the plus 4% minus or plus or minus 4% adjustment, moving up to limits of 5% of total Part B revenue in performance year 2018, 7% in 2019, and then 9% in 2020 and beyond. So because of budget neutrality, CMS has the ability to scale the bonus score by up to three times to balance the penalties that it's distributing on the other end. This actually can kind of go both ways. So for 2017, for instance, because the majority of participants are expected to receive a neutral or positive score, the multiplier will actually probably be less than one, so it will dampen your upside benefits. Now additionally, if you perform well above your peers, you can qualify for an additional bonus from a separate $500 million pool. This is the exceptional performance bonus. So this can boost you up even more. So if you look at the right side, you'll see in 2019 that 4% to 22, 4 times 3 is 12, 12 plus the 10% exceptional bonus that hits you 22. Same for in 2020 and beyond, 9 times the 3 times bonus multiplier plus 10, 37. Okay, next slide. So you finally have all these four categories, your four scores. It combines into one 100-point composite score, and this is published online for consumers and providers to see annually. In the final rule, CMS has scaled back the introduction of resource user costs, 
not scored in 2017, as we mentioned, and now it's only 10% of the composite score in 2018 rather than 15%. Um, and then MIPS APMs have a different weighting scheme, and we'll go over that on the next slide. So the critical takeaway from the weighting is that by the third year, quality and cost have equal weighting. So for many providers, this actually means a reorientation of how they think about and deliver high quality and efficient care for Medicare patients. Slide. Finally, MIPS APMs are treated differently because CMS wants to encourage these kinds of models. So they try to accommodate the APMs within the MIPS umbrella. So for the first year, APMs who are already reporting quality using the CMS web interface are receiving a 60% weight on quality. So these are generally the MSSP Track 1, the next gen ACO. They're already doing uh, quality reporting in a way that CMS can integrate into MIPS. So great, they're fine. However, other APMs, CMS really doesn't want to add burden uh, with additional reporting. So CMS is using 2017 to work with these APMs to figure out how they can report uh, that conforms to MIPS but doesn't add additional burden for them. Okay. Um, and then just, I guess, main takeaways before we move on. Um, yes, MIPS is complicated, but potentially it allows for greater customization and prioritization to better fit your specific value-based and care management objectives. So your MIPS score is partially based on your actual performance, but it's also reliant on how well you document and report that performance and how well your peers do in comparison. 2017 for MIPS is a transition year, so you have a buffer to continue planning your MIPS strategy, but uh, MACRA is definitely the new norm now, so you need to develop a short and long-term strategy for your organization. If you're a high performer, this could include opportunities to really maximize your short-term reimbursement with that three times multiplier with that uh, exceptional performance bonus. Um, or perhaps it is encouraging you to accelerate your transition to the advanced APM track, which we'll cover next. Thank you, Chelsea, uh, for that overview of MIPS. And as you can all tell, there are no shortage of complexities associated with MACRA and the MIPS track. Um, with all the reporting requirements, the new categories, et cetera. And, you know, those complexities also extend over into the advanced APM world. So we want to spend a few minutes here today um, talking about the implications and some of the requirements associated with advanced APMs. And again, as Todd and Chelsea both mentioned, we highly encourage you to visit our website at kaufmanhall.com backslash macro to download uh, some deep dives into uh, both of these tracks will have more information available there and it gets you really into some of the nitty-gritty details that you'll need to understand. Um, with that in mind, again, we'll cover the APM track here and provide an overview of how CMS is approaching this track. And CMS uh, chose the two-path track here with the, the ultimate goal in mind of maximizing participation into APMs, as Chelsea and Todd mentioned, and ultimately in the advanced APM specifically. Um, and as this program evolves, the expectations are that there will be new models that really are focused on promoting coordinated, high-quality, efficient care um, across settings and across specialties. Uh, the benefits, again, of the advanced APM track for those that fully qualify are a 5% bonus uh, for clinicians from 2019 to 2024 payment years, exclusion from the MIPS track, and the potential negative penalties that Chelsea just illustrated. And finally, um, in the outer year, starting in payment year 2026, the ability to receive a higher fee schedule relative to those that are not qualifying or participating in the MIPS track. So CMS has a three-stage process or framework that they use to determine qualification at the, both at the model level as new models um, evolve into the advanced APM track and then ultimately down to the qualifying APM level at the participant level to make sure that clinicians are meeting certain thresholds for participation. So first they determine whether, excuse me, a specific, a specific APM design meets three specified criteria and if these really are centered around IT, quality, and assuming uh, financial risk. And again, we'll spend a little bit more time about what that means. Um, then they look to determine um, whether the specific set of, they look to determine the specific set of clinicians that participate 
in a specific entity within that ACM model. So you can think about a general program like MSSB Track 2. They will look at a specific set of physicians or clinicians in a given geography that are participating within that Track 2 model. Um, and finally, they determine whether during a given performance period, those eligible clinicians, those are participating in that specific entity, collectively meet the thresholds to become qualifying participants. And if so, all of the eligible clinicians within that entity are designated qualifying participants. So we'll walk through each one of these stages so you have a better understanding of how CMS is approaching this framework because there are implications, again, as Todd alluded to, about how you'll want to develop the right strategy, both the short term and the long term for your organization. So generally, the advanced ATM models will include those that CMS has already approved and are currently um, published, and future models that will be evaluated based on certain uh, criteria that we will talk about. The expectations that are that over time CMS will significantly increase the number and the types of models that are available uh, to clinicians, and the types, again, can extend from the ACO type models that you're familiar with to episodic or disease-based or specialty-based uh, models, and again, as their goal is to maximize participation long-term in this track. Uh, in the near future, you really will want to understand what option or options are available to your clinician network so that they are able to maximize the benefits under MACRA. So we'll start with talking about, again, we're starting at the model level and we'll talk about what current models are available in 27, uh, 2017 performance period. And many of these are names that you all are already familiar with, ranging from the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus model to the Medicare Shared Savings Track 2 or 3, Next Gen ACO, um, and then to more episodic or disease-based uh, programs, including the Comprehensive ESRD, uh, LDO and non-LDO models, um, and the Oncology Care Model two-sided risk arrangements. So this list was just published by CMS a few weeks ago, and they have until January 1, 2017 to completely finalize the list, but this is, looks like the list that they are going with. And, and in, in addition to these programs that are already underway, um, CMS has included med the medical home model into advanced APM status as well. And so for those that are participating in a medical home model, there are certain requirements around uh, being primary care focused, entitlement to primary care clinicians, and meeting certain elements around value-based care and risk criteria. And some of those value-based elements include things like coordinating chronic disease, or preventative care, risk stratified care management, et cetera. So there's a, another host of requirements that you'll need to understand if your organization is looking at the medical home model. So again, those are the current models that are available at that highest level. In the future, CMS is again looking to extend um, the range of options available to clinicians. So those will include new ACO or disease state models, some of which you all are already familiar with, which include bundled payments or comprehensive care for joints um, as two examples that are out there. CMS is also looking into a new model uh, called the Medicare ACO Track 1 Plus. And so this was outlined in the final rule. It's something that they are looking for further comments are, but ultimately they're looking at ways that they can expand um, clinician participation um, into models that are really taking downside risk. Um, of important note as well, CMS also recently announced that it expects to open up new applications to the next-gen model and the CPC Plus models for 2018. Uh, participation, so those will continue to be options that your organization will need to look at as well. Um, similar in vain to the medical home model available in 2017, in 2019, CMS is extending uh, the medical home model to include those that participate in the Medicaid medical home model, and it carries a similar set of requirements um, around, you know, empowerment, primary care focus, and meeting certain value-based requirements and financial risk. And, and the new nuance here that folks really need to be aware of that starting in 2019 is what you see on the center of the page. And this is the all-payer combination approach, um, which really allows for consideration for organizations or entities that are taking on risk in commercial or Medicaid populations. CMS really wants to give a credit for those that are already moving into real value-based care, even if it's outside of the traditional Part B model. Um, and these 
all player combination options will need to meet certain requirements around um, IT again, payment based on quality and incentives based on quality and an assumption of sufficient financial risk. And we'll talk about what financial risk means here because that's an important understanding for uh, what models will qualify in the future. So all advanced APMs, whether they're the current models or these newly evolving future models, have to meet certain financial risk requirements. And they ensure that they are taking on downside risk, essentially. So this is the box you see at the top of the page where we talk about financial risk standards for advanced APMs. And ultimately what this means is that in some form or fashion you're taking on withholds, reduced payment rates to your clinicians, or you have clawbacks uh, in place to owe payments to CMS or if you're under the all-payer back to the clinician. But in some form or fashion you are taking on downside risk in this model. Uh, for 2017, what financial risk means and how this has to be more than nominal it has little implications because CMS has already approved the MSSB Track 2 and 3, Next Gen, ACO, et cetera, and all of these models already meet the requirements. But for 2018, as CMS introduces new models, they have to meet new requirements based on a revenue standard, which is the 8% of the estimated average total parts A and B revenue, or what they call a benchmark-based standard. So at least 3% of the expected expenditures uh, for which the ATM is responsible is at risk. So they're saying you need to take on downside risk and you will need to meet at least some threshold that to us is more than nominal and those are the two ways that they're looking at it. And again, these are for new models that they introduced in 2018 going forward. Interestingly enough, um, for the all-pair combination, there's a completely different set of criteria which CMS has finalized for now. And in this model, CMS proposes um, a different set of metrics or measures that they're using to, to say what qualifies as nominal. And ironically, this is much more closer to what they had indicated in the proposed rule. But for the all-payer combination, um, entities that are participating through this approach will need to take on a marginal risk rate, which is the percent of actual spend that exceeds the expected spend. And the APM entity has to be at least responsible for 30% of that actual spend that exceeds the expected spend. Um, there is also total potential risk, which uh, is the maximum potential payment for which the APM could be liable. And this has to also be 3%. So this is similar to what you see on the left-hand side of the page in terms of the um, benchmark-based standard. And finally, CMS is allowing a minimum loss rate up to 4%. So this is the amount that you can uh, go up to percent of actual spend that you can range up to uh, without triggering in shared losses. All of this, again, is pretty complicated. And again, we invite you to visit our materials that dive into this a little bit deeper so you have a better understanding of how this plays out. What's really important to note here is that CMS is seeking comments on the whole risk approach and how they, in the future, will align what they have on the left-hand side of the page there in defining nominal and what they have on the right side on the page and how they define nominal under the all-pair combination. These two divergent paths, as they've defined it today, is not something that they um, seem to be too happy with, and they really want to figure out a ways to make this uh, work in um, cohesion. So that really then defines the APM models, both again for current models and future models of what will uh, qualify or what will count as an advanced APM model. CMS will then again look at the list of participants in a given entity, and they will look at a participation list to determine whether clinicians um, collectively are participating or individually are participating in a given um, ATM entity. And that brings us to the third step about how clinicians within the entity will need to collectively qualify um, for qualifying status. And the nuance here is that they have defined both qualifying participants and partial qualifying participants. And they have two dif uh, different distinct set of benefits. We focused in up to this point really talking about the qualifying participants of those that are participating in one of the ACL or episodic models that fully qualifies and they're meeting certain thresholds. You will be eligible again for the 5% uh, bonus payment, the higher fee schedules in later years and exclusion from MIPS. But they also are providing thresholds that folks can meet to become partial qualifying participants. 
And while you are not eligible for that 5% bonus if you're only partially qualifying or the fee schedule update, you could choose to opt into MIPS or opt out of MIPS as you think is best in your best interest. And so this will potentially allow you to gain in the positive upside of MIPS or stay out of the negative downsides of MIPS. So how do they determine um, whether you are a qualifying participant or a partial qualifying participant? Um, again, this is fairly complicated methodology and approach that we that they have outlined and we really tried to simplify it for our discussion and overview purposes here today. If you go on to our Coffin Hall's MACA website again, we will walk you through the decision trees of how CMS will walk you through um, qualification and we will also walk you through examples of how they would look at those um, methodologies. The important thing to note here is that in 2017 and 2018, there's only the Medicare threshold or the Medicare approach. So under this, CMS will look at um, your Medicare Part B payments or your Medicare Part B patient counts, which is what you see in the teal box at the bottom. Under the Medicare approach, they will look to see whether you are uh, furnishing um, a certain level of payments or a certain patient count um, through your advanced APM entity. So for 2019 payment period or 2017 performance period, CMS set the standard of at least 25% of your Part B payments are met through your Medicare uh, ACM entity or that you're seeing 20% of your Part B eligible patients through the um, ACM entity. In future years, this approach gets a little bit more complicated as they introduce the all-payer combination again. The CMS will still first look to the Medicare option to see if folks will qualify. Then they will defer to this all-payer combination where you have to meet certain uh, Medicare-based thresholds, but then they take into account what levels of risk you're taking in other uh, payer models, whether commercial or Medicaid, that will count towards your ability to qualify as an advanced APM. And again, under either approach, this all-payer approach or the Medicare approach, CMS is um, setting th thresholds based on payments or on patient counts. And importantly, they will give you qualifying status on a greater of basis, meaning if you only meet um, qualifying, partial qualifying status under the payment approach, but you meet it under full qualifying status under the patient count approach, they will give you the full qualifying um, benefits versus the partial qualifying benefits. So they really try and make, take the approach of we're going to give you the greatest status available to you as we walk through the decision tree of um, the Medicare option or the all-payer combination option. So what does this all mean? It means that the rules are pretty darn complex and they are subject to change and they are not all fully um, written out by CMS here. And while 2017, again, is a real transition year, uh, in future years you will need to be aware of the updates that CMS makes and how they could potentially impact your organization. Um, this really means choosing the right path or paths that fit your organization's vision and readiness for value-based care. <clears throat> and so when we think about your organization's long-term macro strategy and short-term macro strategy, as Todd alluded to this at the beginning here, um, we think there's three general big buckets of options that your organization will need to consider. The standalone mix track and the mix ATMs that Chelsea outlined, or the advanced ATM options, which has its own cohort of models that are available to your organization. Your organization will really need to conduct a thorough evaluation and um, develop education materials so that you're really understanding what are some of the strategic implications um, that will impact your organization. And this really means considering uh, some of the key questions that your organization will need to address um, as they go through the strategic planning process. And as I pause here for a second, I do want to remind folks as we come here at the, the final 15 minutes, um, we encourage you to submit questions through the question box um, on the webinar. Um, if you do have questions up to this point on any of the materials we covered and as we start to talk now about the strategic implement, implications going forward. So with that in mind, as you think about the questions that you want to ask today, you'll need to be thinking about the broader questions 
that your organization will really need to undertake um, to prepare for NACRA. And this ranges from questions about, as Todd mentioned, about how you're supporting um, affiliated independent practices that are near market to your employed physician network as well, and making sure that you have a real vision and goals and objectives in mind of how you're really looking to support uh, that broad clinician network. And then it's thinking about what types of alignment strategy, whether it's some of the options we've outlined today or others that need to be taken to really integrate and affiliate with those physicians in your market, um, especially the independent physicians. So again, this can range from hosting some of the ACO models to clinically integrated networks to some of the options available to you if you're approaching an all-payer type strategy. You'll also need to think about what types of investments need to be made. And this really requires a fundamental understanding of what gaps do you have today. Um, as Chelsea outlined reporting, um, coding, and some of the infrastructural requirements are absolutely critical for you to be able to be successful in a value-based care environment, let alone the macro requirements. So you'll really need to be thinking about that from an infrastructure standpoint, from a care management standpoint, a clinical clinician alignment standpoint about where you need to invest, what your strategic priorities are, um, and ultimately, what are the necessary financial resources that you will need to devote to make those investments. The investments that you make in macro will not only benefit you from a Part B you know, professional revenue standpoint for your clinicians, but it really supports your overarching population health value-based strategy as an organi organization. And as you think about these questions, you, you will really need to think about the downstream impacts of what a macro strategy will mean for your organization going forward. And so as we conclude with the webinar portion here, and again, we encourage questions, um, we detailed what we've outlined as a, a five-step approach to developing your macro strategy. And again, the first step is really making sure that you as organization leaders, as board members, or clinicians have a comprehensive understanding of everything that's been published in the macro final rule. That is the basic foundation that you'll need to ensure that, again, your clinicians really understand what some of the impacts and implications are of macro for their practice and for how value-based care um, will transform uh, their care models. Um, again, working with that group, once you've developed in, uh, the baseline education, it's really developing a vision for how you want to approach MACRA, answering some of those strategic questions that we just outlined, um, and understanding what the potential uh, direct and indirect impacts of MACRA will be on your organization. Uh, steps three and four, really evaluating the, the organizational's readiness and those questions that we raised about what gaps are there. Um, how vulnerable is your clinician network. We'll spend a lot more time talking about those in our November 30th webinar, but those are critical steps that your organization will really need to do to set yourself up for step four, which is figuring out what path or paths really um, will maximize the benefits to your organization in the, uh, the short and the long term. And ultimately, it's going to come down to how well you're able to execute on the macro strategy as Chelsea and Todd both mentioned, 2017 is a transition year, but the reality is that MACRA is not going away, value-based care is not going away, so you really need to think quickly about how you're able to not only adopt, plan, and design programs, but you really need to be thinking about how quickly you can execute and what resources you have in play to uh, develop and execute on a successful MACRA strategy. So with that, we have a few minutes here for uh, some questions, and again, as a reminder, um, we have more information on all of the MIPS and all of the APM requirements available at the website you see here, coffinhall.com backslash macro. And if you have any specific questions on the programs, on the strategic planning efforts, and some of the requirements that your organization will need to undertake, we encourage you to uh, reach out to us via email. And with that said, Rob, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Chelsea and Todd. That was terrific. We do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, given all the publicity and the complexity around MACRA, how do we communicate with our boards and our doctors? So it, it's a really good question and um, one where a lot of organizations are trying to figure out how to make a little bit of a burning platform even though this really shouldn't require one at this point. 
I think the, the good thing is, is that uh, with the final rule now out, um, there's a lot more information available. Um, materials is, is, is on and pointed out on our website. Um, other organizations have put things out there. I think there's plenty of material, and I think it's, it's a combination of um, educating on the basics of it, but more importantly, emphasizing the strategic implications. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, as physicians get more familiar with this, as some of them get concerned, whether legitimately or not, that they might be facing reimbursement cuts, um, as it might start to force um, or, or uh, push along certain consolidations in your market. Um, this, you know, in, in our minds is, is going to be one of the major drivers of, of big strategic decisions in, in the next coming years. Um, not that we needed more of them. Um, as this starts to roll out, physicians get impacted um, and, and it sort of reverberates through the market. And, and so, you know, as we, you know, as we presented some of those ideas here, I think you started to get a feel for it. Um, some of the materials we have on our website get a little bit more into the strategy. And then again, if you can join us in a few weeks for the, for the session that's more exclusively about strategy or even invite your board member to participate uh, in that session, I think once they start to, to understand the implications and the complexity here, um, they're going to get behind it pretty quickly. Great. We have another question that's a little more technical, and, and this um, I think will serve as a reminder of the complexities and, and the nuances that um, everybody in healthcare provider organizations are going to have to cope with. Uh, so let's see how we do with this one. We are a MIPS APM, and we'll be reporting a full year of quality data through our MSSP ACO data submission. For ACI, we are planning on submitting 90 days of data. Do you anticipate any issues with our submitting a full year of quality data and 90 days of ACI data? Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, and you're already doing great being in an MSP SP1 model. Uh, based on the final rule for 2017, um, the more you report, the more points you can earn. So your full year of quality reporting will already boost you a lot. Reporting only 90 days is fine considering that you're reporting the full year. The longer you report, the more points you can gain. Um, so that would be the only drawback. Yeah, the, the, you know, the ultimate consideration for those of you that are participating in those models is those of you that have the reporting and infrastructure capabilities already in place. As Chelsea mentioned, the more you report, the better off you are. And given the easing of the threshold um, for the transition period of 17, there isn't a lot of upside um, under the, the bonuses um, as it's set out, right? Because basically anyone that meets the very basic minimums avoids a penalty. What that means with the budget neutrality is that there's limited upside um, on the basic bonuses. But what it does allow you to do is maximize your potential under the exceptional uh, performance bonus, the 500 million extra dollars that are available to your organization. So to the extent you're able to um, maximize your reporting and your capabilities under all of the four categories, you know, there still is that significant upside potential for the exceptional performance bonus as well. Great. Uh, one more question. And, and actually what I think I'll do is combine two questions. One uh, question came in, in uh, pertaining to investments. You mentioned the need for uh, in, uh, an investment strategy around MACRA. What are some of the areas that might require investment? And then the other question that I suspect has something to do with this is uh, has to do with some of the weaknesses or challenges you're seeing around collecting necessary data and doing the required reporting. Yeah, uh, I'll jump in here and let uh, Chelsea and Todd jump in as well. So to the first question, um, sorry, Rob, could you just uh, articulate the first one again for me? Sure. Um, you mentioned the need for an investment strategy around macro. What are some of the areas that might require investment? OK, great. So. Um, I, you know, reporting and infrastructure and technology are certainly one area. Um, as we think about the big buckets of, you know, where we think folks will need to make in, uh, investments, from an infrastructure standpoint, reporting standpoint, technology standpoint, that will be critical. Um, 
From a clinician alignment standpoint, we think that's another big bucket area folks will need to address, and I'll spend a couple minutes on that. And then finally, care management model, thinking about what you're doing from a care navigation, care transition, um, development of clinical pathways, uh, utilization management, et cetera, what investments your organization is making there to really uh, maximize your ability to compete on a value, base, value uh, basis. So again, starting with the first component from an infrastructure standpoint, we think folks will need to make the investments um, to really be able to report uh, timely and be able to collect data from the clinicians and be able to report timely because that's a, such a critical component component for how you are even able to get scored on your uh, macro. Um, so those pieces really need to come into play and those will tend to hit the individual or smaller pra independent practices in your community harder. So thinking of ways that you can use information exchanges or developing infrastructure that helps support not just your employed physician network but uh, also addresses um, the independence as well. Um, and I mentioned clinician alignment, and this can take on a variety of structures, but as you think about, you know, what sort of governance structures, what sort of operating models you have in place, that again brings together not just your employed physicians, but your affiliated physician network so that they are able to understand and they are able to help lead some of the changes that we think are, re are required to really be able to um, maximize your potential under value-based care. And the third piece that I mentioned was the care management, and again, and thinking about how you're, again, working with those cohorts of clinicians to really make sure that pathways and protocols, um, UM referrals, whatever they might be from a care management platform standpoint, are really embedded and delivered uh, through your entire physician or clinician network. And, and the one thing I would add, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder pr to predict, but, but what a lot of organizations are facing right now is the need in, to have additional investments in the acquisition of physician practices. So some practices struggle with this, whether meeting some of the, the requirements themselves that, that Anna just mentioned in terms of investing, whether it's technology or otherwise, or you know the potential of, of reduced reimbursement puts them over the edge financially. What we're seeing already is a lot of markets starting to heat up as it relates to, to those practices looking for acquisitions, and if not acquisitions, investments uh, to help them be successful. And so, you know, again, uh, being Kaufman Hall, as we think about financial planning and long-term financial planning, um, understanding what the potential for that is and understanding how that fits into your financial plan uh, is really critical because um, the acquisition of practices is not cheap. The operational implications of, of running those practices can be fairly burdensome. Um, and, and we think this is going to drive the next wave of it, particularly in those models that haven't consolidated um, as much as, as some of the others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd Fitz, Chelsea Glenn, Anand Christian Swamy, and especially thanks for every uh, to everybody for joining us, especially after a late night, exciting Game Seven of the World Series last night. Uh, be on the lookout for uh, uh, email communication from us about the upcoming webinars, and also a follow-up email to this webinar that will give you a link to the, the webinar in an archived form and also links to our site for more resources. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.